Good morning. Good Ed? morning. Do you prefer Ed or Edward? Edward. Edward. Yeah. Okay. This is the first time I try to shorten it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Good morning, <laughs> Edward. I'm really not bothered. No, <laughs> I don't no, know. It's, it's especially fine. my parents that instilled people not shortening my name. Oh. Yeah, they were like, don't let people call you Ed or Eddie. At the time, because it was like Eddie Murphy when I was at school. Oh. And it was just, they were just like, don't, you're Edward. And I was like, oh. okay. And then that's kind of stuck. Oh, okay. Yeah. But no, it's fine. That's the first <laughs> time I've ever asked you that. Um, so for our listeners, Eugene is in Seoul, South Korea. So we have a special guest today for Hello. making it up. Um, do you want to introduce yourself? Hey, I'm Edward. And I work in animation in Hong Kong for Cartoon Network. And I also sometimes take photos. Yes, and we've done a feature with you. So this is, so people will be familiar with your voice already. I hope so. so are you going anywhere anytime soon and staying in Hong Kong for yes. a bit? Yes, so um, next Saturday, uh, next week I'm going to uh, Miami. Oh. Uh, I'm going to Miami because every year there is a big um, children's animation conference Ooh. down in Miami. So oh. I'm going there to look for... Some kids shows, look at some talk, speak to some independent studios and meet some animators. And um, it's very hard to get to Miami from Hong Kong. So, yeah, it's, yeah. it's, 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 it's the tough, it's the furthest away I go probably in my job for to look for animation. In, in total, with the travel, I'll be away like 11 days. Oh, yeah. you're going to miss Chinese New Year? Yes, I'm going to be does it, in LA. Do you, does that matter to you? It does. It does. Oh. In terms of um, time off work, yes. Oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, it really does. We get the most days off yes. this month. Yes. Well, not just this month, but being in Hong Kong, being able to celebrate Chinese holidays and Western holidays is yeah. a pleasure. <laughs> it's a real oh. pleasure. So this conference is obviously arranged in the West where they don't, they're not that bothered right. about what's happening. Yeah. And then I'm going to LA for meetings where they're also not that bothered. Right. But um, I'm going to definitely try and claim it back because I really, I really like Chinese New Year. Yes. It's I a great share. time of year in Hong Kong. It's really nice. It's quiet and it's, um, it's a happy time. It's, um, it's, I don't know. You see happy faces and shopping. It and is the only time that is gets quiet, I think. Yes. In Hong Kong. Yeah. I, I just stayed in Hong Kong for Christmas for the first time and people said it was quiet, but I don't think it was actually that quiet. It drops down like a little <laughs> yeah. tiny bit. Yeah. But Chinese New Year is the time when it's like the most noticeable yeah. to me. Yeah. When things are actually slowing down. And then, I don't know, maybe for more local businesses, like really no one is doing work. Right. You're genuinely like off. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, yeah. It's that, it's a that real time pleasure. of year. And it's not this year, but some years it's like three whole days, or three yeah. week days off. It's cool. It's cool. So yeah. I'm going to miss that. Do you go to the market? Which market? Have you been to the, it's like the year end market in Victoria Park? Oh, no, no, I've never been actually. Maybe I'll, well, I'm not going to say it this year, but I will look into that because I've always wanted to take a photo of it. It looks beautiful from above. Uh -huh, yes. But um, I've never actually been in. So for the week before the first day of Chinese New Year, yeah. there's this year end market and, and it's kind of maybe three soccer pitches. Mm hmm it's really big and half of it is flowers. So the idea is that you're meant to like buy flowers to decorate your house. And then oh. the other half is like dried goods, which is like stuffed animals or yeah. red pockets yeah. or just um, things that are thematic to that, the animal of mm -hmm. the year. And the craziest night is New Year's Eve. Right. And when I was younger, I used to go like, cause it's the day when everyone's, that's the popular day right, to go right. to the market. Yeah. And when I was younger, I used to always go on New Year's Eve, but oh. now I'm, I think I'm too old. Oh it. no. Cause it's like, so I'll just, I'll go like on the first day. Okay. It's, it's you, more quiet. Oh, um, right. Yeah. So that day is, you probably wouldn't recommend that it's too busy. That's I mean, New Year's Eve. if it, you are visiting Hong Kong <laughs> and you want an absolutely bonkers experience, yeah. then I would say go. Okay. But if you live in Hong Kong, <laughs> I'd say just go the first or second day. Okay, okay. Yeah, it's way more chill. One day, one day I won't have this conference over Chinese New Year and I'll be able yeah. to go. <laughs> one day, one day. Or one day maybe, oh no, they'll never change their dates. They'll be. They'll no. never be like, oh, Lunar New Year, we should <laughs> exactly. <laughs> change our conference dates. It's probably not going to happen. No. All right, so um, I'm going to jump into my topic yes. for the day. Yes, yes. What I've picked is something we shared in Tuesday's briefing this past week, and it's that Huff Post, formerly Huffington Post, is closing their contributor network and they're launching these two new sections called Opinion and Personal. And basically the idea is that they're not 
taking um, non-paid writing anymore. Right. Yep. So previously they were operating kind of like Medium, but they were in existence before Medium. Yes. Where just anyone could, like you or I, like we could just submit something and yep. chances were pretty good that mm-hmm. it would get published. Um, and now they're not doing that anymore. They're only going to like commission posts from writers, like reach out to people who are familiar names to them. And I thought it was just interesting because, well, one, I think it's a good thing. Yeah, definitely. I I was going to ask you like your thoughts on that. And then also I think it's just a signal, hopefully that writing will be valued more again. Yeah. 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 I wanted to ask if, um, has this come out of the goodness of Huffington Huff Poe's heart or have they because the tone of the article in the briefing suggests um they didn't like it people didn't like it that this Mm. this kind of writing for devaluing of writing Mm. for exposure but did Huff Poe realize this because I I I don't find very often that a company decides hey we're just we're gonna stop exploiting today right I think actually that it is a I think that's very discerning of you I don't see HuffPost in that kind of light. Like they would just do it out of the kindness of their heart. Like I do think it's a business decision and they kind of say it in. um, So we linked to like an opinion essay on the on the HuffPost piece, but HuffPost made an announcement as well. And in that announcement, they say, oh, we recognize there's a lot of noise in media now. Like anyone can publish it right now. It's really common on Medium and LinkedIn for people to be publishing on their own blogs. Even there's like kind of a resurgence of that. So I think they're actually the business decision is like trying to differentiate themselves by being more selective. I have noticed that I treat Medium as a professional publication when I'm, you know, in my eyes, when I'm reading something, sometimes it's so good that I can see, I can feel myself it could be Bloomberg, uh-huh. it could be Wired, it could be anything. And then you read the odd article that's really that's just a bit sloppy and you're like, oh yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm reading someone, some, someone's just thoughts yeah, that yeah, they, yeah. Just, they just published. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's just Medium has taken it to a level where it feels more professional than Blogger or WordPress you know yeah I maybe do because agree. their app is slick and I'm not sure or what maybe it is it's that like how are you finding the articles like how do you discover what you want to read um I use pocket um which is an app which has some must read articles and mm. what it does is it mixes in the New York Times and um the Verge and it could Atlantic and it could come from anywhere and if you're looking at it on your phone you may not see the borders around the text. And quite often that's how I end up reading a Medium article. Very recently, I actually installed Medium. So now I'm more aware that I'm reading Medium. Right, yeah. But even still, as you're reading a, an article, it's just a white background, black text. Mm-hmm. You can actually feel like you're reading a, a, yeah. a, a, a New York Times opinion piece. Yeah. Um, and then you get to the bottom and maybe it doesn't have a conclusion or something like that. Yeah, and right, then right, you're right. like, oh, right, that was just um, someone's thoughts. Okay. I think it's because... Mm-hmm what medium does well or it has enough of a community that it does pick out the good stuff yes so if you're getting it from like pockets must reads or yep. if i come across it through like twitter or facebook then yep. it's probably already you know the True. top five percent yeah instead of because like i've never just browsed medium no like i've no. never just uh, let's see what's like recently <laughs> published so i've never the, done that no the, I, I wouldn't even know how to see what was recently published yeah. but even on the front you're right the front page of medium is all good stuff yeah and then um i guess that way their algorithm works if you search for a particular topic the top stuff you see will be good as mm-hmm. well it might be older but they make sure it's good mm-hmm. so actually i'm not seeing the really bad stuff you're right i don't yeah. know where i, I didn't know, i don't even know if it exists yeah. which is probably a good job on their part but again going back to unpaid writing mm-hmm. Oh, it's just a fine line, you know. Medium's a platform. They, they're, I'm sure they're trying. They are making money, right? They have a subscription membership, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and then HuffPo. But I think it's it's different, right? Because HuffPost is well. I mean, I don't think it's reputable like the New York Times is reputable, no, but no. I think we still perceive of it as yes. a news publication. Yes. And I think the idea of a news publication not paying their writers right. doesn't seem right. No, it doesn't. And now I, just while you were speaking, I just thought of this little distinction in that Medium is a sharing platform, mm-hmm. whereas HuffPo 
pays some of their writers. It has right. a staff. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, exactly. So in that sense, they have um, way back with this contributors um, thing, they've made a decision that although we're paying our staff, we also don't value every piece of writing, but we want it to come through our platform. Yes. That is, and so they've dialing back from that is a good decision. Yes. I think so. I think so. I think so. I think it's that it doesn't sit quite right to have both under the same name. Yes. Or like, if HuffPost really wanted its own sharing platform like Medium, I would expect them to like, start something else instead of just having their opinion pieces be collated from the public yeah what i see in the comments um like after this piece came out and just in response to huffpost closing the contributor network is that oh there's besides huffpost there's Mm -hmm. just been a lot of damage done to the concept of writing and and i was wondering actually you're kind of the perfect person to talk to about this if photography is sometimes treated the same way absolutely absolutely i don't know okay it's it, i'll tell you the slight difference as i was thinking about this um topic and that is that you can use this platform um it started with Flickr maybe and then Instagram and there are all 500 px and there are all these other um photography platforms you can use them to improve as a photographer mm-hmm. um and so one as I always say the barriers to entry became a lot lower with Instagram being a mobile only app at the, and at the same nexus as the iPhone camera getting good, good enough to just yeah. take decent pictures yeah. now amazing pictures but at that moment with the f- iPhone 4s and it was an iPhone only app mm-hmm. it, it, it said look anybody can take a good yeah. picture and then here's the platform to the here are the here's the platform that can teach you to how to be a better photographer at the same time and at that moment um a photographer's the, the game of photography which was owning a, having a studio having a dark room having these contacts at newspapers and brands and doing these advertising and commercial gigs it just fell apart because um a new way of of um of showing off your work had emerged mm-hmm. so that happened with photography. What I want to know from writing is that does reading other people's writing make you a better writer? I think it does. Yeah. I, I I go for, if you read a lot, it will help you be a better writer, but it does come down to, you have to write. You have to to write. To become a better writer. What I'm asking is, is it, is it the same? It's similar, but is it the same? Is, is, is devolving this um, structure of paid writing into um, write whatever you want and then we'll show we'll show everyone will it surface the best writers or I mean I, I, do you know what I'm trying to say D- did did it help or d- did it did it create as we just alluded to earlier a load of not a, a load of not very good writers I think <laughs> I, I don't know I I am of two minds of the on yeah. this because on one hand I think medium and sharing platforms and even the HuffPost contributor network. One good thing is that it opens the gates, mm. right? It allows um, that you don't have to be professional yep. in order to write. Yep. And I think that's a good thing to yep. encourage more people to get into writing. Yes. But the bad thing that happens is the idea that oh, anyone can write, but um, <laughs> writing is not an occupation. Yes. Like it's not valuable enough to be a full-time occupation Absolutely. that affords you like a living salary. Yeah. Yeah. Right? Come, come and come and write for us for free, but keep doing the other thing you're doing because we're yes. not going to pay you. Yes. Yeah. So somehow I want it to be like, I want platforms that encourage anyone to get into writing, mm-hmm. but they still preserve the idea that writing is a valued occupation like right. it takes work yeah. and it you have to practice for yeah. years to, mm-hmm. in order to be you know a professional yeah. like i i just i'm not suggesting that uh, i feel bad because i don't want to be like oh don't write if yeah. you can't commit to it <laughs> yeah. but i also want the idea of writing to be valued the way like being an accountant is you know yeah like, yeah absolutely i i think um one thing we have to come to terms with is that there are business models being set up online that 
change all of this? So we, we've talked about writing, we've talked about photography, but imagine being a um, hotel. We, we only look at hotel, well, mostly look at hotels as chains and huge corporations, but imagine hotels as people that have learned the craft of providing a service mm-hmm. of like a bed for somebody and looking after them in the morning mm-hmm. and taking care of the credit card details and all that kind of thing. And then Airbnb has come along and said, That's anyone true. can, anyone with a bed, can now look after someone when they come to that that place, right? That's... And then if you look at Uber, you think about, okay, I'll give you a specific example. There's a um, that's something that taxi drivers in London have to do, and it's called the knowledge. And I worked with it's someone. It's called the knowledge. The knowledge is knowing every street in London um, without any sort of GPS. This is something right. that's been for, no, for like 100 years. Okay. It's literally a, it's like an institution. Uh-huh. There was a recently, maybe in the last year, a documentary about it in the UK about people learning the knowledge. And that what they do is if you were out on the streets in London on a Saturday or Sunday morning really early, you'll see guys on like mopeds with like a map in front of them and they're learning the streets oh. of London. This is this has been an institution from obviously before Google Maps, right? Uh-huh, uh-huh. And um, that was the barrier to entry to being a taxi uh-huh, driver, uh-huh. to being a black taxi driver, uh-huh. right? Uh, minicabs, um, which is like unlicensed cars, um, sprung up in London purely because of people just don't have the time or... Not, not knowledge <laughs> to, learn, <laughs> to learn the knowledge which is that's what it's called um and you go and do a big final test you do like a load of series of small tests where you go in a room and right. somebody literally says um <gasps> russell square to Vauxhall bridge that's and then you, you tell them every single route to road to get there um re- regardless of traffic and that and now uber came uh-huh, along uh-huh. and that barrier to entry has been wiped out yeah, and 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 now that a company have come along and said anyone anywhere can be a taxi driver. You just need a car, and so that is these are the economies that uh, people are railing against. Uh-huh. Um, whether it's photography or writing or um, hotels or actually, I don't hear hotels moaning about it so much. To be honest with you, maybe hospital. You know, I never even equated. I think you're totally right about hotels and Airbnb. Yeah, but maybe hospitality is still preserved as a complicated thing yeah and i think so and i people think people generally accept that an airbnb is not going to be a hotel right right so like i think hotels probably still think there's something they're offering that airbnb doesn't yeah. but at a very base level when i look at going somewhere i look at them as equal choices now yeah i'm like oh can i stay in a hotel uh you were just in tokyo yeah, right yeah. i find there's a, a, a lack of decent hotels in tokyo there's a there's a really high end and then there are just some really budget ones. So I stayed in a budget hotel, um, the APA hotel or the a- a- ABBA. Or yeah. In, in which one did you stay in? Do you well, know I stayed in two different ones. I stayed Shin- in Tomicha? Shinjuku Gyomae and okay. Higashi Shinjuku Kabuchiko, I think. Okay. Anyway, yeah. there, there is one on every block yeah. of the city. Okay. And it's fine <laughs> but the reason the fine. reason i opted for it over airbnb was a purely economical decision okay because the location of those hotels is better yeah than like the airbnb yes. options basically yeah. um but to get back to what we were saying it's funny because i definitely think you know one of the great things about the internet that a lot of people talk about is democratization Dem- democratization yeah you know that you and I can be an Airbnb host yeah. or an Uber driver yeah, or whatever, yeah. but we have to acknowledge that that is eroding those industries. Right, right. I, I mean, I talked about the knowledge being, a, it's not a university thing, but if we take a lot of college degrees that um, that people studied for in our, in our lifetime and our friends and, yeah. and those things that we were guaranteed, we put all that money into higher education yeah. because we were told we were going to be this thing um and now it's just wiped out by the democratization and the tools that were if someone told my friend who did pass the knowledge and is now a black taxi driver it took him maybe eight years to do the knowledge um which is long um but you know the average is like like four or five but actually just when you told me that and I'm yeah. thinking about Hong Kong, I just like, there's no way I could do it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely, I you could know, take eight years. I wouldn't be able to do it. There are some drivers out there that whatever small street you say, they they will know it and then tell you two different 
ways to get there. And you're, I'm like, that's like the knowledge. Maybe but, they just got it over time. They didn't know uh, it on, on day one. Right. But basically you need to know on day one. So imagine right. not the knowledge, but just imagine someone doing, I can't think, uh, what's the equivalent? Like, a, let's just say English language or a creative writing degree, mm. something they, you know, okay. their parents paid for some Ivy League education okay. in that. And then they get through it. They do a couple of years interning and then HuffPo say, we're taking submissions from everyone. Yeah. Like that is yeah. kind of what we're going to have to deal with in a many, many industries from now on. Yeah. As people work out how to democratize everything. Uh-huh. And you can't stop it. And it you can, you can protest but, against no, it. No, I don't think you can stop it. Um, I, I do think like the taxi, black taxis and Uber is a good comparison because you would have to trust that actually me having the knowledge yeah. is of more value. Yeah than an Uber driver yes. with Google Maps on his yes. smartphone. Yeah. And you just have to trust that like that gives me my edge. Yeah. Like that's what I'm going to rely on. Mm -hmm. And I imagine we have to think of ourselves in photography and writing and creative industries the same way. Yeah, yeah. That your experience and your contacts count for something. Yeah. Um, I'm always worried from a photography point of view of, um, what's that word? Stagnating. Mm. And that there's someone below me who is learning new techniques faster and one day I'll just totally be shown up like I'll, you know I'll, I'll sit because I wasn't paying attention so even the older people who have that knowledge or whatever their edge is they have to kind of stay on their toes because these people are coming up this, mm -hmm, this democratization mm -hmm. means that people could surpass them at any minute yeah. which is quite exciting in a way yeah. um I think Airbnb isn't the end of it let's for example I think that there'll be something better something like you know like a a building full of airbnbs and somebody right. will be like hey that's a hotel <laughs> but, it, right. but it's much cheaper or something like that right. you know but it's this isn't the end of the democratization we're just hitting a certain stage i think i think just what worries me is not like increased competition like what worries me as a creative person is not increased competition from people getting into the industry mm. but how brands and companies respond right and i think I just hope that the way things end up is that brands and companies don't take advantage of everyone. Right. Like right. they don't you pick <laughs> you against you. They're like, oh, well, I found a writer who's going to write this for five USD, yeah. you know, yeah. and you, what are you worth compared to that? That, like, that just sort of pitting of people against each other. From a photography point of view, I have to say yeah, that has happened. Mm -hmm. that, that has already happened down to the down to the free level or maybe almost starting at the free yeah. level. And um, there's no union for like freelance photographers all over the world because the, also the benefit of this is um, of the democratization is that it's now global. I would say from uh, going, just going back to a photography point of view for, for a second, you could pre-internet, if you were an editor at a magazine, you had, I mean, how many people could you contact to knock together some photos for a story for you? Not, not that many, yeah. you know, but now you can look at anyone, anywhere, yeah. contact 10 people at the same time in different mm -hmm. corners of the globe who you know don't know each other and say, can you just do this for me for free? And the chances are somebody will do it. Right. Um, and if not, no harm, no foul. You just yeah. go and ask another 10 people at a much right. lower Like they feel cost. comfortable yeah. asking, which I think is concerning. Yeah. And, and um, definitely... It definitely just like, like I just said with medium gives the impression that this is a free thing that I'm enjoying. Uh -huh. Um, and it's mixed in with these things where I know people are being paid to do it. No, yeah. but yeah, so it's, it's, it's an interesting paradigm and I wouldn't want to be a writer right now <laughs> with my own column, you know? No, me yeah. neither. I, I definitely think writing the, Asking for it for free is very common right now. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And receiving r good writing for free. Is I was one thing I would say about writing though. I don't know about you, but I often feel <laughs> maybe people feel this way about photography as well. But I often feel with writing, I'd love to do that, but I, I can't be bothered. <laughs> 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 I reckon I could write something cool, but tomorrow I'll do it tomorrow. You know, I, I'll just read today. <laughs> uh, writing at least takes more time. Yeah, I think. <laughs> Does, does. Um, more brain power as well it does take some amount of concentration <laughs> yes yes and that yes. i think one of the writers accidentally um one of their advantages is that we're all just 
like our attention spans are falling to pieces. Yeah. And whenever I read something that's well written, that's really long, I just think kudos to you for this putting this true. together because I this don't. I've, I've had all these thoughts um, scattered over ten days. Right. You know, but right. I, I, I haven't put them together like you have. Right. So that is that is definitely an advantage. I, everywhere I turn, I see attention spans just falling apart. Mm-hmm. Um, thanks to the magic of the internet. That is true. I think writers that are able to write something that takes you 15 minutes to get through and yeah. you actually get through it, yeah. they are a more talented yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, breed of writing than five, 10 years ago. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think that um, people that even um, read these things, they're even, they're looking for shorter sound bites. So even if you're, even if you find te- someone or an audience willing to spend 10, 15 minutes reading your writing that you've won, you know, you've done, you've done okay because... I mean, in terms of my in photography, I'm looking for people to look at something for two seconds, mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm. to take three seconds out of your day, please, to just look at this. Um, and te- I'm, I'm increasingly, as I, I do this thing where I, I move the apps on my phone and I try and put things I really want to do on my front page. Uh-huh. So like I've moved Medium and Pocket um, to my front page along with some other things. And I've done that because I want to spend more time reading. Yeah, I want to spend less time just um, looking at photos. So I it, think that's I'm a good to, plan. Yeah, it's like what my front page right now has Medium, Pocket, and Feedly as well. Do you use oh, Feedly? Yeah, yeah, I do use Feedly. Yeah, so between the three of those, I think that's a good start. Eugene's a big Feedly user. Yes, as well. But we used to. I think he, I've spoken about it with him. We used to use Google Reader as well. I used to use Google yeah. Reader. Yeah. Yes, I speak to so many people who used to use Google Reader. <gasps> you know, the day they closed Google Reader was, was the day, I, day. It was the day I realized Google aren't in it for me. I, mean, <laughs> yeah. I was like, I just. I, honestly, it's funny <laughs> yeah. that we wound up here because I honestly still do not understand that decision. I, I'm like, doesn't th- can't you just leave a server somewhere I that know. does this thing? I was like, please. Google's so massive. The least you could do is just not update it. Yeah, that's you yeah. don't have to shut it down. Yeah. Just you, stop maintaining do, it. Do like you, you know what it was, right? You know what their plan was. It was that um, <sighs> it was they were so big on Google Plus at the time. I know. Um, they had that guy, I forget his name, who was in charge of, I don't even think he's at Google anymore. He was in charge of Google+. Plus. He saw the fervor and the passion of people for Google Reader. Uh-huh. And he was like, uh, I'm going to move. These people will definitely move to Google+, Plus if I shut down Google Reader. And I didn't. Did no, you? No, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't. absolutely did not move to Google+. Plus. I never would. <laughs> I wanted to I wanted to read all the articles in the world. <laughs> I just said I, that makes no sense yeah. to me. I wanted to read all the articles on planet Earth in a ma- in like a line format in my own time. I wanted to see headlines, uh-huh. read the news yeah. and share them with my friends. And I had like maybe five <sighs> friends and we consumed so much information every day. This is making me so <laughs> sad. Yeah. I'm so and we sad don't, thinking we don't. about it. I, I, I don't know what I did with my time. I definitely think my... My overall reading just like Dipped. dropped, yeah. just like spiked down yeah. after Google Reader died. And it took me so long to like build Come back, back up, up yeah. other because methods Feedly of reading. Because Feedly is 80% of Google Reader, but it's still a little bit off. It yes. was it's no, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes. So, uh, there's never been a day where I've like been like, oh. ah, Feedly's amazing. You know? No, no <laughs> yeah. I I'm like, Feedly like, will I'm, do. I'm so sorry <laughs> if anyone's listening to it. Like, I'm a huge Feedly fan, but I've just... <laughs> But having been Google Reader first, Feely's just like, this is the backup plan. Yeah, this is the second choice. Maybe that was the start of the democratization of articles because they were all in a list by anyone, right? The the writing, it was just, it was just, there were sources, but you could just choose all and read every mm-hmm, article mm-hmm. you wanted without reading even who wrote it. Right. And you could read all of your different sources together yeah, yeah. in whatever format you wanted. Oh, now you I'm could sad. group them. I know <laughs> yeah, yeah, by category. Yeah. Like yeah. do you just make your great. own categories? It was, great. Um, it was great. But I I mean I definitely this is a bit off topic, but I think the decision is because they wanted to go towards social. Yes. And Google Reader. The beauty of it is that yeah. it's not social. It wasn't social. It's like it your own social. private thing. Yeah. And but you, d- did you ever use the like sharing it. part of it? The I last, don't think I did. The last six months of Google Reader, they added a part where you could just have. I... It was a real bolt-on solution. It was because they could Google weren't good at social. Right. But yeah. You could. I'll try and find a screenshot of it. You could share things, and then you basically you'd share it 
to a particular folder and then that folder had an RSS link uh-huh. and then you give that RSS link to your ah. friend and it would appear in their folders. No, I've never yeah. done that. So At the then, most, I'd just be like copy link and then No, you just needed to it. press the share button and it would go to ah. someone who also had that folder I available. I like that though. Yeah, and then you'd like see your friends later and you'd talk about it. You, there just wasn't this big Facebook Twitter sharing thing at that time for me. Yeah. Um, but it was, everybody was across the same things. <sighs> I know, I know, so it's so sad. sad. Because it seems, <laughs> I don't want to sound like high and like um, snobby, but it, it was like a higher, it was like a really smart version of using the reason to use the internet, you know, uh-huh. compared to now where it's kind of, I look at comment sections of articles and you just think, wow, everyone's so angry. Yeah. Like everyone's raging and everyone's yeah. so divided. Yeah. You know, that was almost like we were all on the same page. And I do bit. think there was, I mean, I wasn't using that sharing function, mm-hmm. but it does remind me that I feel like in the previous days when we were reading the internet, my friends and I were reading the same articles Yeah, and we were able to have like conversations about them. Yes. Whereas now it's like... There's just so much out there. I have no guarantee that you've read the same thing as me. No way, no way. It's just, it's an abyss of information. (laughs) The internet is just outrageous. And it means, what it means is a lot of the time I cling to the same sources Uh, um, that I trust and I know, not not necessarily other people have read, but I know that writer or something right, like that. Right, and not right. not know, but you know, you know that writer's mm-hmm. work. And you're like, oh, I'll look at the verge and I'll see that the the like Neil I Patel wrote something. I'm like, oh, I know, I know how he thinks. Let me see, let me get his take on this. Right. Um, and it's very hard to find anything new. I did a I did a kind of not purge, but I did I did I went to look for new sources recently to read stuff, and I found um outline oh. um and um Um We at Make and Read. The outline quite often. Outline's cool. A big and I, and topic. I, re, re, I don't know topic. You should give topic a go. Okay. Um. Um. The outline. I basically followed um, Joshua Topolsky, like mm. his trajectory of his career. So he used to write in Gadget, and then he moved to the Verge. He, well, he found helped found the Verge, and I stick stuck with the Verge even after he left. Um, just because I like the way he thought he thought and the what he instilled in the people that he dragged from in Gadget to work mm-hmm. there. And then he went to work for Bloomberg and that has stuck with me. And I read Bloomberg yeah. a lot. And then uh, he's now an outline and, and I love the way they approach um, topics as well. And then I still read The Atlantic sometimes. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. one thing Same. that's scary is that I think Eugene's spoken to me about this before is that how many of the, the sources are from the West? And so even yeah. if you're reading something about Asia, you're reading it from a Western point mm-hmm. of view. And you you can see some things that might be a bit off or wrong yeah. about them, but um, there aren't enough sources in English about Asia. Yeah. Yes. Um, I basically only read Hong Kong Free Press. Yeah, yeah, now. yeah, yeah. Um, um, yeah. Tom Grundy. But it's, it is very news-based. Like I yes. read it for coverage, like yeah. what is happening right now, as mm-hmm. opposed to um, analytical or opinion. Yes. So there is that problem. And and um, also another thing that comes up is knowing, and as, as things have got more divisive, knowing the slant at which the article is going to take. So just mentioning Hong Kong Free Press, I found since their inception that they've taken a very, um, I, I think it get, if you look at their articles on Facebook and what gets more comments, it would be something that's like anti-China. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've, so I've tried, always tried to bear that in mind as I read it, that it has a certain slant to it. Yes. And obviously it could be editorial, but also a lot of, um, publications these days are kind of, they have to get to be a little bit clickbait. Right. In the, yes. in, and, and that is, that has definitely changed since Google reader times. Right. Yeah. 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 You have to draw people in because there's so much out there. They have to get those clicks. Actually, this is kind of a great segue into your topic because yes. we're already on the subject. Yes. If you want to introduce what you wanted to discuss today. Um, so I wanted to discuss an article that was in the briefing about, um, China, taking a stand um in in this time of america retreating china stepping forward and maybe being a global leader Mm -hmm. in culture and and in other things i was focused on culture but there there, there are many um, facets to what they're trying to do right Mm -hmm. 
So um, that he, they want to be a bigger global player, and yes. they're kind of seeing America's weakness, and you know, yes. just or not weakness, but their country's inner turmoil, turmoil yeah. right now <laughs> yeah, as an opportunity the for them to step up. Yes, yeah. So uh, my initial thoughts on this, um, uh, the reason I chose this topic is because I've had these thoughts for a while, and I wanted to share them with you. Yeah, go for so, it. So. Um, I'm starting to realize since I'm, I moved here, uh, moved to Hong Kong, um, I've started to realize how big America's influence in culture, soft power has been in the last 50 years, Mm -hmm. 50 years, I'd say. Yeah. Maybe, maybe 60, 70 years, but, um, and try, I've, I've tried to take a step back and think about how that happened. Okay. And um, what I come to the conclusion of, I'd love someone to tell me I'm wrong, but I feel like what Britain did in terms of creating this empire in the 18th century and 19th century was to leave some things behind and those things being the English language. They spread the English language throughout the planet as a second language. Mm-hmm. Sure, it's still the language that people are learning most as a second language, but... Um, Britain were the ones that sowed the seed both in Asia and in the Americas. They just, and Africa, just, I'm just we're just going to leave English behind <laughs> in yeah. our colonies. You're going to learn it. And even I though mean, we're even gone. Here. Yeah, it's even here. Right. So real English. Real impact on my own life. Right. So you, you had, the English is there. Mm-hmm. And then um, wherever they could, they left these Western valleys behind India. Um, a lot of people still look to the British as these um, really posh, fancy people. Mm-hmm. Not just the, not just that, but the, just a lot of cultural values that are were essentially British have now spread, um, right? Or sp- not spread? They've stayed. They've stuck around and given people an idea of Western culture, mm-hmm. right? And so they retreated. Britain retreated like 1900s at some point in the 20th century, but America stepped into the void in a really cool way. Right, yeah. <laughs> right, right. So everybody had that language already. In America didn't have to interpret much. They had to just drop Disney into the vo- into the void. Yeah. And at a time where globalization 1.0 was happening, right? So TV mm-hmm. came along. Um, I would say um, people's view of television, uh, maybe in, over the last 20, 30 years, has been um, American and then their local TV compared to American. Right, maybe yeah. the movies and TV. Hong Kong's an anomaly because it has always had an amazing um, film industry. Yes, well, on its own that didn't look to the to. US. Yeah, used to. Yeah, right. I mean, I, one thing I've done lately a lot is on if I'm flying on cafe, I'll watch some Hong Kong movies. Oh, that's so um, nice. Because it's because it you see the streets of Hong Kong um, yeah. in color. Yeah, in a way I've never seen them before. Yeah. just in the background. Um, so that's cool. Um, but it didn't take you. The movies do not take cues from Hollywood, mm-hmm. but. A lot, a lot of people do. A lot of movies do. A lot of countries do. They go, go to the multiplex to watch a Hollywood movie. They subscribe to HBO wherever they are. And now, in Globalization 2.0, we all talk about Netflix every day. The mm-hmm. matter, just to segue a tiny bit, Netflix have done a cool thing of bringing more global TV to the table. Talks yeah. about. Um, yeah. It's talked about in a way that. Ha- absolutely has not happened in the history of television. Yeah. Like the whole world to talk about Dark, which is a German show, or to talk about Erased, which is a Japanese show, never happened before. Yeah. You'd discover it on your own to, and then you'd hopefully share it with your friends. So the point I'm getting to is that America laid all this on top of a British foundation of English and, and Western values. And it was very easy and it was almost an accident. America had no say in what they, you know, they, they profited off um, what was already laid down. Um, and what I'm saying is China may want to step into this void of America retreating, but it will be harder because they were so closed for so many yes. years. People don't, uh, regular people don't understand the values. They've never had an opportunity yeah. to, to, um, to have, to have Chinese values, um, put on people or, or un- have them yeah. understand it. And then two, the language is obviously a huge barrier. Yes. So, I also kind of wonder, so I'm no historian, yeah. but I do buy your, this argument that Yay, you are positing. Good, I really do it's just been in my head it. for ages. And one thing that I think is an advantage to the States has just been that English is very easy to learn. <laughs> and I think universally <laughs> that this is just true, that a lot of countries 
it's very easy for the citizens to learn English as a second language. Why Why do you say English is easy to learn? Oh, I think English as like fundamentally as a language really? is easy to learn. Really? Yeah. I've, I've come across people who've said it's really hard. What? But I mean <laughs> yeah, like even, yeah. I mean not, okay, not to like perfect it to yeah. like write an essay, but yeah. to understand a TV show, I just think it's yes. much easier than Chinese. Yes. Like well, Mandarin. I, see, see, I, I would agree yeah. with you because of speaking English, right? So, but I would love to speak to someone who had never come into contact with English. I mean, I'm sure someone's going to fight me on this. <laughs> yeah. I'm I've, sure. I've, I've had my world turned on my head because I've thought my whole but, life what you said. I've, I've totally thought English is easy. English is easy. But you know what? When I started to learn Cantonese, I thought to myself, oh my goodness, we have so many tenses uh, in English. You this know, is true. The, the, and, and then to be able to not use a tense. Yes. I mean, if you took the tones out of Cantonese. Yes. To not yes. have to speak in yes. tenses. I was like, oh my yes. goodness, that would, that would have been so much easier my whole life. Yes. Yes. You know? But tenses is not crucial to like understanding right. the language, right? right? right. Like right. you can understand swim without needing yeah. to know yeah. swam yeah. and yes. swam and swimming. Yeah. Um, but anyway, to get back to the topic. Yeah, of, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, Chinese as a future potential cultural power mm -hmm. i think one thing that is interesting that has happened with what we consider western media is that it's almost considered neutral at this point and uh, let me explain what i'm thinking yeah. um so it's in japan right for the month of january and yeah. i was working in a lot of coffee shops mm. over my time there mm -hmm. um and i noticed that all of these coffee shops were always playing U.S. top 100 songs. Oh, I, I'm I'm gonna talk about this. Yes, I'm totally agreeing with but you. But I this. don't actually think. Well, I I could be wrong again, but I didn't think of it like these coffee shops weren't trying to emulate the states in a way. Like they had right. other parts of the, like the hospitality and the coffee they were brewing that yep. were like Japanese in yes. nature and was like they took great pride in that. But somehow when it came to a music decision, mm -hmm. I think they just think of those Western songs as like a blank standard yeah like this is this, yeah, is, yeah, the this is the default this is the yeah, default this is the default and that's what i mean i mean oh man i could talk all day about this yeah. <laughs> honestly that you, you're spot on so what i found is you you mentioned music but i would say if you mention um a building so i have lost count of the amount of people i've brought to hong kong and they look at central plaza and say Oh, so that's like Hong Kong's Empire State Building. Yes. Right. Yes. So I went to something recently about a new, um, um, a new apart, a new apartment building that's being built in Saiyan and the developer was like, "Oh, and Saiyan will be like um, at, uh, Hong Kong's Brooklyn." <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know yeah. exactly what you yeah. mean. So it's almost the the. Uh, you're right. America is the standard. Of everything. And <clears throat> I've heard I, I, the Brooklyn metaphor applied to absolutely every city. Everywhere. Oh, I, oh, those people are very Brooklyn. Yes. Right. Or like this that, this area or that coffee true. shop. Like you, as if we all understood that, yeah, what that and, meant. And you know what's crazy about that? I've had someone say that to me who's never been to Brooklyn. <laughs> Right? That's, that's just, how much the standard, that's yeah. how much soft power they laid yeah. down over the last yeah. 50 years. And it was, if you think about where it came from, it came from TV and movies and books and um, comedians and personalities. Yeah. It's it's Jerry Seinfeld. It's Chris Rock. It's hip hop music. Yeah. It's everything. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It has been, They ha there's enough output in there for them to fill the void of anyone who isn't making enough music, mm -hmm. movies or TV mm -hmm. or books. And and then w when you add in the distribution channels that have grown up over the last twenty years, be it Apple's like like the iTunes yeah. Store, um, um, Spotify, well Spotify Swedish, but um, the iTunes Store, Google, Facebook, um, Netflix, everything, you have your own content. Mm -hmm. But to build a breadth of anything else that you want to watch in this all you can eat yeah. world, the rest will be American. I'm just trying to picture a future where you can say, oh, that's like the Bund, like in Shanghai, yeah, that area. And yeah, then people yeah, would yeah. just understand that. Absolutely. Um, and actually, you've got you've hit onto another sticking point mm -hmm. that I see is a problem with like Xi Jinping and the CCP's plan, right. which is that they have to allow 
their citizens mm. to access foreign networks. Yes. If they actually want to export yes. cultural mediums. Absolutely. That is, oh yeah, that is actually bigger than the two that I've mentioned because one thing that um, um, the US did in the last 60, 70 years is make every citizen a cheerleader of their own culture. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So the, you, the things that we mentioned earlier will mostly come from Americans. Yeah. They will say, well, that's just like Brooklyn or yeah. that's, oh, that's so California, you know, or, but <clears throat> if um, if mainland Chinese people cannot <laughs> get on those networks yeah. to say that is, what did you say earlier? That That's, oh, that's like the bund, yeah, you know? Yeah. Uh how far are we away from from hearing that? We're very far away from exactly. hearing someone go on Facebook and be like, "Oh, that new sky- set of skyscrapers in um, Dallas that looks very much like the mm-hmm, Bund." You mm-hmm, know mm-hmm. that if you can't be there to make the comparison with someone, then you're not really at the table culturally having that conversation. And so that's something that Xi Jinping and the the party are going to have to consider. Yeah, the, definitely um, the export of culture. Like just the technicality of how that's going to work yeah. because, okay, right now China has a substitute for everything we have, right? Yes. Like a, a Chinese Twitter, a Chinese, yes. Chinese Facebook, yes. et cetera. And those are widely used yeah. and it's it's actually good internally, I think. Mm-hmm. Like I, it is lately, I think, encouraging to see the cultural products that are coming yeah. up in China. It's great. But there's no way for me to access that. Yeah. Like it's really difficult. Yeah. There's a very high barrier. And if you... And if what China's saying is true, like they want to bring it to us, mm-hmm. then I think they have to absolutely move they, it onto some to other out. platform. Yeah. Just, just to stop you for one second, I yeah, just thought of it. another one because you just said yeah, it. Yeah, go for it. Um, when people say the Chinese Twitter, right? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. I didn't even that's, realize I was that's doing that. That's a huge one. That's oh. a huge one. That, no, no, New York yeah, Times or something. They, the the Guardian, they do it all the yeah. time. They'll be like, oh. It's Weibo. Netizens on Weibo. It's Weibo. The Chinese Twitter. Yeah. But what I always say is... But it's funny because I was just like, I'm just going to say Chinese Twitter instead of Weibo. (laughs) But but what what happens... When do we stop saying that? Because Weibo, I'm pretty sure Weibo has 700 million users and Twitter has like 300 million. Yes, exactly. I, I have seen it in one article somewhere, but somebody did say it's... Twitter is... The US is Weibo, if that makes sense, or something mm-hmm, like that. But the mm-hmm. only th- reason you can't say that is because Twitter is used all over the world. Actually, it? it is interesting because what could happen is, you know, I think China is reaching a point where instead of copying Western products, they're mm-hmm. starting to make their own. Mm-hmm. And in different ways, like tech products, um, hip hop groups, fashion brands, yeah. they're starting to find themselves yes. instead of copycatting other people. Mm-hmm. And I think what could happen is Western brands and Western companies starting to imitate China. Yes, yes. That might be the turn that of the tide. That could be the turn. I still... Um, we th- could find ourselves saying that, like, oh, this is the US I think XYZ. There's one, <clears throat> there's one company that um, are a real success story out of China, um, DJI. And everybody is everybody is in their tailwind. Uh-huh. Every, they are far and away the leading drone manufacturer. Yeah. And what, ha- what happens with that is that when you... Recently, the US, I don't know if it was it DJI, I'm pretty sure it was DJI, the US, um, some department of government in the US alluded to the fact that DJI might be spying, they might be using mm. their tech to, you know, like, we need to have a US company making drone ma- just like DJI, because mm. um, they have ties to the party or something yeah. like that. And you, you realize that you hear that quite often as well. There's that you, it, when China does come up with something, was Alibaba or Tencent or something like that. It's it's viewed with skepticism. Yeah. So they have that. It's like their founder or the, uh, this investor has ties to the party, and therefore it's not as free or amazing as the product that you're currently using. And so it's like trying to have another job on to turn people's yes. minds around about the yes. skepticism of of surveillance. Yes. Actually, it's funny that you mentioned Alibaba because while you were talking about DJI, I was thinking of Jack Ma. Oh, yeah. Who I think unintentionally is being a kind of ambassador for Chinese culture yeah. just by being articulate, yes. English speaking. Yes, and yes talking about you know education in china honestly yes. and those videos have been widely shared yes like yep. i'm talking about these things and just that fact is true um turning focus onto china it is. And, but I, I don't think he's like doing it 
with some well, greater like party agenda. No, no, he just yeah, <clears throat> yeah he just ha- he wants to sell his coast company. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. It's hard. Like while we're talking about it, it's so hard to think of how how that culture could it could reach a kid in East London, or how that culture could just reach a kid in. Um, Boston, you know, yeah. like I, I just don't see the the tipping point. Um, I, one thing that's happening, obviously, with Chinese investment, and we all joke about this all the time, is that as um, Hollywood needs China more for its movies uh-huh. and TV, you're starting to see um, Chinese products enter mm-hmm. um, Hollywood movies. Yeah, you're either seeing <clears throat> locations in China or Hong Kong. And or you're seeing um, mainland Chinese actors appearing in yeah. Hollywood movies. That is just a 1% kind of solution. It doesn't really address, it doesn't get that cultural, um, it, does, it doesn't translate culturally. Mm-hmm. It's not the same. So I don't, that's their current plan. The next, the other, the other thing that I'm seeing, and this is less of a soft power thing, but this is more of a, a tool, is that I'm seeing, recently there was a situation where uh Cambridge University in the UK um they wanted um them to re- rewrite some books mm. and they wanted to they wanted to, them to historically reflect from a Chinese point of view what happened with a certain situation I can't 100% remember the situation but ever in the end Cambridge University relented and didn't do it even though they were getting massive investment from Chinese um students coming in international students um and that is another way that the West spreads its message, has spread its message over the last 50, 60 years is yeah. to tell history is written by the victor. Yeah. So they've managed yeah. to tell the story of how they won World War II and how this was important and how democracy, um, capitalism works and democracy works. Mm. China have to find a way to not just export Twitter and, uh, sorry, Weibo and, yeah, yeah. and WeChat. They have to get across the, um, they're the good guys or what we're yeah. doing is, is a good, is good for like our we're people. The, we're not the enemy. We're not yeah. the enemy. Yeah, yeah. Not necessarily we're the good guys because there are no good guys. I'm right. Very cynical. Just, <laughs> but, yeah. but we're not the enemy. Yes, exactly. Um, and that, that is probably yeah. more important than the language thing yeah. or, or anything else. Though when I think about like you're asking, oh, how do you reach a kid, like a teenager in Boston or East London? Yeah. And when I think about that, I think of, um, streetwear and hip hop. Yeah. And I think like those are not ways that China necessarily wants to yeah. have influence, but I can see that happening very easily. Like yes. Kanye choosing to wear some Chinese local brand. Yes. And then just by that, yeah, that's yeah, how it yeah, spreads. Yeah. Speaking of that streetwear and hip hop though, that is in the briefing as well, right? Yeah. There, was, there, was, yeah. there was something about the ban on it. Yeah. And it wasn't so much a ban, it was more to do with um <clears throat> it's, the, these new rules. Uh, yeah. about what they want to promote right yeah, so yeah. and one of yeah. them it was it, the words used in them are just and this is going to sound so terrible but you, if you want to export your culture it's got to be cool yeah <laughs> like, it's no cool. i agree it's got to be cool. and it says I something agree. about if you're not wholesome I agree. yeah if you're not wholesome then the party will not support you and i'm like nobody's looking outside their country for I wholesome know. for the word they're not going to use the word wholesome <laughs> i don't yeah i think on a very fundamental level like you don't really understand <laughs> yeah. what people want no. from entertainment yeah yeah that stuff that i mean if we go to like the 1950s right so like world war ii has just ended and and, um, rock and roll, right? So this is a thing that is very normal for us to look at now, but it was shocking for the parent, uh-huh. the, the adult generation at the time, like guys it flinging was. girls and their skirts going up as they did these dance moves. Yeah. And then Elvis, so like we move into the early sixties and Elvis Presley, um, they didn't show his bottom half on the Ed Sullivan show because his hips were too sexual. His hip movements were uh-huh. too sexual. Like that is essentially... Like China of today, just saying, let's yeah. stop that. Yeah, um, it's just Which sounds is just so, when hilarious. You think, when you think of where we are now, yeah, 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 you think of where we are now, like a TV, TV like station <laughs> saying, only show the top half of this man because Ooh. the bottom half of him is too sexy for of television. This fully clothed man, <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. It's just completely unthinkable. Right, right. So, so, so China's so, still stuck. Yeah, in so a way. If, if we look at that, we're like, we're quite a way away, and it takes it takes these people yeah. like Elvis, like. Marilyn Monroe, like yeah. all these people that push the boundaries a little bit, like Madonna. Like if you like for me growing up, like my sisters listening to Madonna, my older mm-hmm. sisters, and Madonna's like single covers and album covers were quite raunchy. Mm-hmm. Like there was like well, she had a song called I mean, Her Panky lyrics are her lyrics, right? Like even not, looking back now. Not right? PG. Yeah. But push 
every one of them pushes the boundaries, mm -hmm. becomes a little bit more global, a little bit cooler. And that, that ingrains in people that they want to be part of that movement. Mm -hmm. What I think is going to happen and what I think is kind of funny is how China accrues cultural power in the world is not going to be under the CCP's control. True. And yes. that's how it's going to happen. Yeah. Like Chinese citizens, creatives, musicians, yeah. photographers, yeah. they want to be part of the world yes. and they want to contribute. And yeah. they're going to do that regardless of what Absolutely. the government says. Yeah. And it's just funny to me because it's like, like you said, the CCP only wants what's wholesome. They only mm -hmm. want to export a certain thing. And that's not, that's, that's never going to be it. effective. That's not it. I think yeah. um, another way to look at it, um, if we just take the language part out of it, another, they've been, they've been niche in the West and kind of controlled as in, look at this cool thing that's happening in Korea. So K-pop have managed to export without anyone being able to speak Korean yeah. purely through, through, well, not purely through, but I don't know how you feel about K-pop, but I feel it's very 90s R&B. <laughs> and um, also, but the visuals are like, you cannot take your eyes off these music videos. Yes. They have amazing production values and they're super sexy, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and that is a way that has, they've managed to do it in a very niche way. It will never be the biggest thing in the world. No. Um, but, <clears throat> but yeah, I think they've managed to do something and export out of Korea, make a lot of money that way. Previously, Japanese culture beyond music well, I mean, broke out of broke out of Japan. Japanese a, video games are video widely games. popular. Yes, so, yes, and still are. And so, we love Nintendo. It was a globally yes. loved treasure. That has just come to me now. So, yeah. so in a way, we may not know the thing that right. makes China break out. Right? right. Yeah. It may not be. It may be something we know nothing about. It's true. I I never thought about that. Japan without ever. Um, well, without ever saying, hey, we're going to learn English and, and give something to the whole world. Yeah, no. They, they didn't have to. They just did the coolest thing ever. Right. Back, <laughs> in, back in the day in early video games, they just, people would play Japanese language video games yeah. and just guess what yep. the buttons yep. meant. 100%. And they, they learned. Were so much fun. It, yeah. it was so, yeah, it was so much fun. You persevered until you mm -hmm, got it right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're, yeah. you're right. You're right. I, I don't know what it is, and, so, but you're, um, you're onto something there. It I is. like the idea that we don't know yeah. what it is that's going to come out of China and just... Could be Bitcoin. <laughs> <laughs> it could be like, that's the only place you can get Bitcoin. Oh, and Bitcoin man. is now the world's currency. And we all have to just be, be on, on board with China. <laughs> it's so funny because Eugene is not here, but he would absolutely love that. <laughs> oh, why is he huge into Bitcoin? Yes, he doesn't want me to talk about it, but he's been like... <laughs> He's <laughs> not here, so I can say it. Yes, please do. He has alluded to it several times over the past couple of weeks. Like his Twitter <laughs> timeline has been all about crypto and he's gone to meetups. So. Has he? I'm going to go to meetups with him. <laughs> oh, yes, please. Message him. So I met, so this is going to wrap up all of what we talked okay. about. Okay. Yeah. I'm going to tell somebody else's story, but it's probably worth adding to the briefing. Okay. Um, it's a story in Bloomberg from yesterday. Mm. And it's about a guy, um, a black guy, a black American guy who was a banker and he went onto some bank's program um, to become a trader. But apparently trading today isn't like it was when he wanted to be a trader 10 okay. years ago because it, the fun is gone um, after the downturn in the economy. Mm -hmm. But it went, instead of that, he found crypto. Okay. And he started, um, he started following Bitcoin and realizing that in Hong Kong, the price of Bitcoin was way lower than in China. So he could buy Bitcoin in Hong Kong and sell it on an exchange in China. Okay. All he had to do, he had to collect his winnings in China. So he had to go to Shenzhen and take the maximum amount of a, a, a ATM every day. Yeah. I mean, how cool is this story? And then he got friends in on it so he could go and get more money out of the exchange. He now has a 40 person Bitcoin futures trading company in Hong Kong. And I want to meet him. You should. <laughs> and um, I see, I have a very surface level understanding of the blockchain and uh -huh. Bitcoin. And I just need someone to explain it to me in the, like with, with figurines. You should, <laughs> you should bring to me in the Eugene most, with you most basic to meet way. this man. But like, I'm, I'm like, I know there is something there. It's like a gold rush. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. I don't want to get caught or burnt. I'm sure many people did back in the day. People keep alluding to this thing with tulips. Does anyone? Have, have yes, I have read the tulips metaphor. Yeah, there yeah, was it, a weird. <laughs> I'll send you a link. It we've actually. Sounds we've, insane. We've included it in the briefing okay, before. Okay, okay. Um, 
So yeah, this people will talk about how much people were burned by the tulip, the tulip sensation. Um, okay, but so I know this, this is just like this, honestly, I think it is an outdated metaphor, <laughs> and I don't think it works. But it is such an interesting story in history that you yeah. should read about it anyway. So it's called Tulip Mania, and it was a period in the Dutch Golden Age yeah. from 1619 to 1622. What? It lasted three Wait, years. Is that right? Three years. I thought it was like a six month thing. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay. Anyway, it was in the 17th century, okay. like maybe 1620s, 1630s. Yeah. And it was at the peak, like a single tulip bulb was being sold for 10 times the annual income of a skilled <laughs> craft worker. I'm, I'm reading from the Wikipedia right now. Anyway, um, there's this uh, writer, Stratechery. Have yeah. you heard of him? Mm-hmm. Um, he's written about the tulip bubble as it uh, relates to crypto. So I will send that to you. Yes, please. Yes, yeah. please. Yesterday, um, um, I hope well, well, it depends when you're listening to this, but um, Bitcoin is in the process of a huge correction mm. and it's fallen. Yesterday, it fell by like two, three thousand mm-hmm, um, dollars mm-hmm. in value. And everybody's like, get out. I'm, on t- I'm following a lot of people on my Twitter who are just like, get out. now's the time. You said it was just going to go up, that kind of thing. And then other people are like, this is just a correction. It's going to be okay. I know nothing. I don't know who to believe, okay. but I know that there is something here. I honestly feel like this way of um, making a currency is fantastic and foolproof. Where the, the value of it is undetermined yet. Yeah. But it's it's absolutely superb in a way of decentralizing currency. Uh, it's almost the last. So what did I read yesterday? It's, it's the last thing a government can control, yeah. um, and that could be taken away from them. Could make quite a lawless society. But either way, I know a lot of it is happening in China because one, moving money out of China is very hard, mm-hmm. and two, um, the conditions for mining Bitcoin are really favorable in china because there's a lot of free electricity there and you need huge amounts of processing power now yeah Um, and and china's always been good at anything that just requires a lot of time and manpower manpower, because that's what they have (laughs) right 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 so watching i've watched two documentaries on yeah um i've watched two documentaries on it and both of them i've just found myself nodding my head like yeah that that sounds right (laughs) that sounds like where it would be in in rural china it is all happening and somebody is making a ton of money off of that um it may be bitcoin to think i can't think how but ju- that you've blown my mind with that video game analogy there was no need for J- japan to um assimilate with the west mm-hmm. they just exported what they did mm-hmm. that was cool mm-hmm. and maybe china could do that in some way yeah i think that's a good place to wrap things up yeah. for the day yes all right. If you are interested in hearing more about Macon and our membership opportunities, which include exclusive content, members only Slack channel, our weekly briefings, you can check us out at Macon.com. There you can also listen to more of our stories focused on the sights and sounds of creative culture. You can also subscribe to us through your favorite podcast app and iTunes. If you like this podcast, you can do us a huge favor by reviewing us on iTunes or just sharing this episode with a friend. Also, this is a very special episode. So if you are into Edward and you enjoy his guest um, appearance, you can share this episode and you can also follow him on Instagram. Yes. What's your handle? Edward KB. Yes. Um, do you want people to follow you on Twitter at all? Yeah, if you want to. It's just more of the same. <laughs> I mean, same I mean, thing really, duplicated. Do, yeah, don't, don't, try not to follow me everywhere because you will see the same three, <laughs> three or four times. Um, this is the opposite of the kind of message I should be giving. But just <laughs> Edward KB somewhere. Just follow me somewhere. <laughs> or don't. It's fine. Yeah, so don't, yeah, it's totally fine if you don't. It's all about May Can today. That's clearly what, yeah. I like that. Very humble. Thank you. I'm Edward. I'm Charisse. And this is Making It Up. 